Um, my name is Mark D'Souza Shields. I'm with the International uh, Fund for Agricultural Development. And together with uh, a microfinance center, we're pleased to offer this session um, on inclusive rural finance value chain activities. Um, we want to have very short, we're going to have some short presentations in a moment from our guest speakers and, and including myself. But I wanted to start by saying, you know, that over the last uh, decade, or really two decades, inclusive finance or finance uh, that's going to populations that have had troubles getting finance in the past has been very successful in a lot of markets, including many of the markets of the microfinance center members. Uh, yeah, and smallholder farmers and, and the enterprises that they deal with, the SMEs that they deal with, have had increasing access to finance and financial services, yet still worldwide there is a, an enormous gap in financing for smallholder farmers. It's over $270 billion, and this is despite some of our best efforts. Uh, and when I say our, I mean commercial financial institutions, microfinance institutions, cooperative financial institutions and international and regional uh, financial institutions like the IFC and, and EFAT. Uh, and we're just not close to filling that gap. Actual and perceived risk, lack of market scale, transaction costs, lack of financial knowledge on the part of smallholders and vice versa, lack of ag knowledge uh, on credit and credit risk management on the part of lenders. There's a bunch of different reasons why this gap is really hard to close and constrains the expansion of services sometimes services that we know will work. Now, nevertheless, and more positively, some experiences over the last few years, including advances in risk management, particularly around climate, but in other areas as well, product innovation and digital transaction cost reductions uh, provides great opportunity and a, and a good deal of hope for increasing the accessible, useful, and affordable financial services in the ag sector. Now, uh, there's also an increased interest from impact investors of all types, and of course, from the public sector and the international financial institutions. And we're all interested in innovation and scaling services of, uh, and, and getting more financing to the agricultural center, sector. We're going to take a look at these issues today from an inclusive rural finance value chain perspective. And to do that, we have uh, the three of us on the panel, Leah Soko uh, Soroka, sorry, I'm gonna, Program Manager, uh, uh, Climate uh, Agri-Finance Agri for Eastern Europe and Central Asia for the IFC. She does a bunch of work with them, including building advisory services. She's worked in green finance, climate smart agriculture, and she's worked on instruments in agricultural finance from crop receipts to securitization of agricultural receivables. She's done this in China, in Africa, the Middle East, and she's worked in agricultural equity funds and all sorts of other things, a really great, great resource for us. So thank you for coming today, Leah. Oh, oh I should mention she has a bunch of degrees. Uh, one is a PhD in sustainable decision-making and innovation. Really happy you're here. Uh, Perlat Asuli is the CEO of the Savings and Credit Association Fed Invest in Albania. He's where the rubber hits the road. Uh, he's a pioneer, Fed, Fed Invest is a pioneering MFI. He'll probably tell you more about it. Uh, they serve 75,000 members. It's cooperative, financial cooperative. And he has been a, in Fed Invest for some time, uh, having many different positions, senior positions, now CEO. He's a financial risk management and organizational development, product development uh, expert. And he has an MBA uh, as well as a graduate degree in mathematics. There will be a test on his memory about uh, calculus at the end of the session. Uh, myself, I'm the lead regional technical specialist, uh, rural finance and all things market for the NEN region. That goes from Morocco to Djibouti to the Balkans across to Central Asia for the International Fund for Agricultural Development. I've worked a lot in inclusive finance and corporate social responsibility, impact investment, and I've worked in over 90 countries in the world, and I'm tired. <laughs> but we're so glad you're all here today. And we're going to take five minutes to eight minutes each to tell us, to talk to, about some of the challenges and opportunities we see from our perspective uh, for financing uh, that, or trying to finance, close that financing gap for uh, small smallholders and the related SME uh, in the agricultural sector. Um, at the, please send your questions in the chat. Uh, we may or may not uh, 
address them as we talk, but certainly at the end, we will try while we're opening up the floor for questions at the end. So with that, I would like to ask Leah to, to lead us off. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, always a pleasure to talk about um, access to finance and particularly the small farmers um, uh, out there. So Mark, I think you hit the nail on the head that there's many reasons that we have a gap in access to finance uh, for the small uh, farmer market. And um, you know, just to repeat very briefly that often financial institutions uh, such as uh, the banks and others don't have a good handle on agriculture. You know, they do ag loans, but then to really understand the, um, the risks um, how the risks can be mitigated and really unique things like uh, I'm a farmer myself. And one of the things that I do uh, tell people is that if you uh, get a farmer involved in your business, if you are financing to a farmer, you can often have them as a client for 40 years. And so it's kind of beautiful when you understand that, that in client retention, um, in maintaining clients, that if you have a young farmer and they have certain needs at this part of their, uh, if you can call it their business cycle, and as they grow and expand, and then often when they are in a larger, um, um, you know, let's say more affluent situation, there will be the opportunities to, to pass on to other generations, uh, the assets and continue the business. So for me, um, agriculture, is a, a very good business. And um, we do see this in today's markets. You know, what did we see with COVID, right? Uh, COVID happened, many of the SMEs and lending to SMEs, you know, sort of fizzled out because due to quarantine restrictions and other things. But the one thing that was strong in the world was agriculture, right? And, and even if you look at commodity prices and other things, commodity prices are high. Agriculture is real business. And so it makes good sense for financial institutions to understand that. At the same time, you know, uh, financial institutions are uh, have their own requirements for data, for reporting, for security, uh, and other things. And uh, farmers need to have understanding what those needs are in order to get credit uh, and to manage their own risk of taking credit on board and developing their business. But if we can overcome the informality and understand agriculture, one of the biggest uh, remaining challenges is how do we bring down the transaction cost of making a loan, right? And this is where we see opportunities now with big data. And I would say, I don't know if we want to call it exactly artificial intelligence. Uh, maybe some parts are right? Uh, some parts might be automatic decision making, but we can see access to big data and computer systems that can really help change the economics. You know, at one time, uh, let's say 30 years ago, banks invested in their own MIS. Now we're like management information systems. And now we can see uh, off the shelf systems that are become much more affordable and can actually change the dynamics of the efficiency or the effectiveness of a large institution applying a loan, you know, uh, providing loans or uh, smaller enterprises uh, providing loans. So where we see um, the future in, let's say, the inf if I can call it the informal formalization of farmers, is we can use big data to assist and we can use computer systems, uh, computer programs to help us make sense and let's say um, understand the small farmer better, understand what they do have, understand that when we give a loan, where that loan is going and monitor those assets at a distance. And this is where in IFC, we do see the future going in terms of um, uh, making smaller loans more affordable. And in the microfinance area, you know, microfinance being different than let's say banks, where microfinance will maybe not require the collateralization up to a certain amount. But there is too uh, a benefit that if you can remotely see where the farmer's land plots are, remotely see 
um, their assets, and we see the reliance on movable assets. You know, one of the issues we talk about is lending for cattle or livestock, and sometimes financial institutions will say, "How do I know that?" Uh, or give a loan for a cow. Um, you know, they say that cow died. How do you keep track? And, and there are some amazing technologies coming to bear on this. We've been talking to um, technology providers on, well, there's the RFID tags, you know, that they put the ear tags and you can keep track. But people say that, that can be, you can, um, you know, can be frauded out, <laughs> I guess you can say. But now we do have other technology where they uh, consume a bolus like a big tablet that stays in their stomach and they can track uh, the animal, they can track if the animal's been stolen. Um, and even if the animal is under health duress, it will give uh, warnings to the farmer to take it, you know, to, to track the animal and find where they are. It can even be useful in breeding cycles and other things. Um, and I think in Africa, our colleagues uh, ran a, a hackathon and now there's facial recognition for cows. And so I, I know you say it's funny, but with COVID and uh, monitoring who's traveling everywhere, now we can do this on livestock. Well, the same thing with Sentinel data, with, um, uh, with satellite imagery, remote sensing, that we can take a look at what's going on and how we can keep track. So I know I'm going around the bend here, but uh, just to quickly summarize, there have been these major obstacles to lend to smallholders, but now we see access to data, access, and this is what I mean by uh, informal formalization, that through GPS, we can see where people are actually farming, even if they don't have land certificates. We can see the assets on the farm. We can track better the movable assets, that all these things should give comfort to financial institutions to provide better, faster and cheaper financing to a growing agricultural sector. The end. <laughs> That's fantastic. And, and the facial recognition for cows, that great. I actually started my career as a, as a dairy herdsman. So, you know, worked on the farm. For a lot, I'm gonna go next because we wanna maintain the, uh, you know, sort of the flow of the rural finance chain. And you're at the, you're, you're, you're far downstream. So you can tell us when we're done, you know, how accurate, you know, you think we are based on, you know, your being right on the front lines. We had tried to get a farmer or a farmer organization represented, but we weren't able to in time. So uh, you have to represent them as, as best you can as well. I will go next. Um, as many of you know, uh, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, and I have to read this off the paper because I'm still relatively new at EFAT. Well, we're an international uh, financial institution, uh, a specialized United Nations agency. We're based in Rome with the other food and agricultural institutions, World Food Program uh, and FAO of the UN. And we've been around since 78. We've lent uh, over $23 billion. Uh, uh, it, uh, well, we had provided, sorry, $23 billion in grants and loans. Uh, mostly sovereign loans to governments um, and have reached an estimated uh, 500 million people. Uh, we've invested about 1.4 billion directly to rural finance activities around the world. Uh, approximately 260 of that is in the NEN region, uh, which uh, microfinance center uh, members are from. Uh, and, and that's just over the last decade or so in some 20 programs. Just so you know, just so you understand, uh, we, we're trying to be very people-centric. Uh, we want to figure out what their financial needs are and then try to meet them. So go back upstream to the financial service suppliers. We want to be catalytic. We want to leverage and ignite investments. Uh, we are a small agency compared to others, and so we really have to make the most of our money. And everything that we try, to, everything we do, we try to make it sustainable. So if we're trying to develop new products or services, we want them to be around long after whatever programming uh, is the, re it, it, whenever the program is closed. Um, and we work with commercial financial institute of every stripe, formal and informal, uh, and we're moving into non-sovereign lending. So if anybody's out there in the region with a, a small ticket uh, SME investment in ag, we're interested in learning about it. Um, 
some of the things that I'd like to talk about, uh, some of the, uh, the opportunities that we see, and, and Leo was very kind to uh, express a few that I would like to also talk about. Um, what we saw is smallholders continue to produce a substantial proportion of national and international food supplies. We know that. In Africa, for example, it's up to 70% of the national supply. It comes from smallholders. That's people with two hectares or less. Depends on the country, obviously. And so they're, they're very important, and we need to be able to finance them to get their productivity up. Uh, they're also increasingly looking for and, and applying digital tools, not just in finance, but linking digital tools on the farm with the finance products and services so that we're really seeing an integrated view to what the, the, the risk is on the farm. Um, and But we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves in that area because we know that there's a limitation, particularly for the smaller farmers and the poorer farmers, what they can actually do. So for example, we just did a digital survey of demand for uh, adaptation loans in the Sudan. We got 300 responses and it's all on normal mo mobile phones, not on smartphones. So we're still dealing with that kind of level of technology with a lot of our clients. So like I think Leo was properly cautious about where we're going with that, despite the facial recognition of, of Bessie the cow. I mean, we've got a long ways to go yet. Um, one of the other things that we're seeing a lot of is uh, smallholders and related SMEs are developing uh, value added activities in many countries. And in many, they're looking at niches uh, specifically in uh, territorial origin markets, organic, natural, agroecological premiums. And where this once used to be kind of niche, you go to places like Vietnam and in other places, Georgia, for example, it's a very big, fast growing market. And you tap that with multiple incomes that most smallholder families are now developing. You see, you've got a migration income, so remittances, you've got agro rural tourists. Uh, I almost went to Albania to do that, sorry, for that next, next year. Uh, so you see households gaining lots of different incomes. And so what Leah was talking about was movable income, a movable collateral is really important because the whole family will be involved with different income streams and they'll have different assets. And you gotta look at the family unit somehow. And Leo, you also notice it evolves over time. Where are they in their business cycle? What events have just passed? Or what events are we expecting in the future? Can we provide credit risk products, insurance products for them? Can we provide savings products for them? What can we do in a fuller financial sense? And I think that's one of the key opportunities going forward. And I know Perlat, your, your organization does a lot of this. It's saying, what is my whole pocket opportunity here? with this farm family. It's not just the loan, which may or may not be the most important part to begin with, right? We, maybe we want to do savings programs, which is a better, or trap or, or track and trap the uh, remittances. These are really important things that we can build financial services around. It's not just lending, obviously. Um, and so what are some of the main challenges that we're encountering? Uh, market intelligence. We just redid our uh, rural finance policy. Uh, happy to say it passed our board yesterday. It was a big deal. <laughs> market intelligence. We need better and more market intelligence. And that's why I brought up the digital survey. There's other ways of doing it, but we need better market intelligence so that we know how to serve the evolving needs of the smallholder farmer household. Really important. And, and the same, we need to develop profitable commercial services uh, for, those, for those needs. So the financial institutions have to make money. And they have to be um, at scale to do that. And, and I think, Leah, some of the digital solutions you're seeing gets us to that scale. Uh, we need new types of risk, uh, risk measurement and credit risk management. Why? Because climate, because of socioeconomic events that are happening that are out of the smallholders control. We need to be able to measure, uh, measure those in advance better. And we also need to measure those post-loan or post-financial service. Why? Well, when you're in, in our business where we're trying to create new markets, donors need to see the impact, right? And we're working with a couple of fintechs, uh, one from uh, India and one from um, uh, Germany. Well, we want to be working with them. We're talking with them. And they have credit risk programs, uh, climate credit risk management programs, and measurement, impact measurement post-loan. And this is really vital information for us to understand 
you know, what products we should be pushing for the smallholders, the enterprises, and for the donors. Um, some of the tools that we use, so you understand, um, we use innovative, uh, we use innovation and market development challenge funds. We're increasingly looking at those because we want the, the ideas to come from the businesses and the financial service providers. We don't want to push what we think is important. Matching grants, both to the farmers and to the financial institutions. Lines of credits, obviously, to the financial institutions. Guarantee mechanisms to when we don't have you know, means for collateral. Uh, and risk management programs and technical assistance for farmers, financial uh, service providers, and policymakers. Our overall challenges, I would say, are making things sustainable and stick, scaling the products and services, and measuring the impact. So with that, I will leave the conversation to you, Perlat. Thank you, Mark, for your comments. And uh, thank you, Lea, also for your comment. Agriculture is uh, indeed uh, a real business. And uh, the pandemic uh, period already showed that. We are, uh, uh, as Fed Invest, uh, as Mark mentioned in the beginning, we are the largest uh, cooperative uh, institution, finance institution in Albania. Uh, and we have more than 75,000 members uh, that are served uh, throughout uh, the country over uh, through 60 branches we have throughout the country. We have been uh, for about 30 years now in, in microfinance business, uh, supporting consistently micro entrepreneurs, uh, small farmers, and, uh, and uh, particularly businesses in rural areas. Uh, we are proud to have kept the, the mission of, of being a social finance institution. And, uh, and uh, over the years, we have supported uh, uh, and financed thousands of farmers and micro entrepreneurs. Uh, of course, the, one of the challenges, as was mentioned, uh, is how we close the gap of uh, financing and, and, and how we increase the financial inclusion of, uh, of smallholders and farmers, uh, especially in remote areas and, and, and you know, having also these uh, typical small businesses. Uh, meantime, keeping the social mission, keeping the, the, the low pricing uh, for, for them and uh, also getting into a scale. So our approach towards that has been really to 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 have uh, to work towards a one-stop shop uh, uh, approach towards the financial and non-financial services for our, our members. So over the last few years, in collaboration with our strategic partners such as JICA, Japanese International Cooperation Agency, Rabobank, and EPSE. We have worked with the focus to transform our organization into one that can provide a wide range of financial and non-financial products and services. This was fully driven by the needs of our members. Uh, in 2021, we were able to provide uh, utility payments for our uh, members and also uh, payments uh, online from members to members. So these were the two new products, uh, financial products that we were able to offer in 2021. And this was also uh, driven as well by the pandemic situation. So we wanted to go as fast as we can with these types of products. And uh, we were able to do so. And uh, But in addition, uh, what we consider really uh, an outstanding achievement has been the creation of uh, uh, ABBA Center or Agribusiness Assistance Center. Uh, it's, it's a physical center, but it's also a platform uh, that is supporting this center. It's called abaonline.al, which provides a wide range of non-financial services to farmers and all value chain actors in the agriculture sector. Uh, of course, as mentioned, this was made possible with a strong collaboration with JICA and hard work of our resources and, 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 and other resources that we engaged in this project. Uh, so, as, as I mentioned, our approach has been really to provide a one-stop shop or to work toward this concept, one-stop shop uh, uh, for our uh, farmers and for our micro-entrepreneurs so that they can get a wide range of financial services and non-financial services. So, if we focus on, uh, on ABBA Center and non-financial services, because it's really important to understand that we grow because our members grow. We grow because their sales grow. We grow because their businesses are growing. And uh, 
and they are managing better their products and activities, it's important to understand, uh, you know, how we drive uh, their solution, how we drive their, their solution to their needs. And for this reason, in 2018, we, we carried out a large survey uh, to members of FedInvest and non-members to understand where they can, uh, where they can, how they can uh, increase their sales, how they can increase efficiency, how they can find buyers, how they can plan for their for future seasonal uh, plants or products that they want to do, how they can export, how they can find the input providers, how can, how they can create business networks. So all these came out as 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 wants or objectives of our, our let's say as 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 means as needs for for our farmers uh, to, to to or, or let's say as, as objectives for our members and and non-members actually that are potential for for Fed Invest. So Aba Center was conceived uh, to provide on-site services and online services for for, for members and non-members. Considering the pandemic situation over the last two years, we haven't done much on the on the on-site activities. Instead, we have focused online activities and making sure that the platform that we, we have worked and built is really providing the services that uh, our farmers want. In the platform of abaonline.al, farmers uh, and other value chain actors can get information for product technology, for main subsectors of agriculture and livestock, daily market prices for certain agricultural products, farm calendar for seasonal works on a monthly basis, information for export standards that are required for agricultural products, information for subsidized schemes and government, uh, that government provides to incentivize agriculture. Uh, as well, they can find information for key actor categories of value chain in the agriculture, including farmers, agriculture input providers, agriculture input uh, equipment providers, agriculture pharmacies, uh, production collectors, agri-processors and exporters. So we've, we've, we've taken the whole range of, of key categories in the value chain of agriculture sector. Uh, in addition to this informing, educating, and uh, uh, let's say uh, uh, functions of our platform, we have also built the platform that they can, that we, that our farmers or value chain actors that are all in agriculture sector have a marketplace where a registered user can promote their products for sale or request to, to buy other products. The platform enables users to create business links and networks. As well, the platform has a, has a volume that uh, you know, uh, users can raise topics, can talk about it, and you know, they can share the best experiences and practices. As well, we have a, a key expert team that you know are providing uh, within 24 hours specialized, dedicated answers to questions that uh, uh, users of the platform are raising. So, uh, all of this, uh, you know, is is done. Uh, all all of this can be accessed by our farmers through internet browser or through application that we have built for both for, for, for both uh, operating systems Android and iOS so it, it really it means that uh, just need to have an internet and you can access it everywhere in the country and everywhere in the world because it's internet based service and app based service uh, with this we, we, we believe that we have made a breakthrough and this is a unique uh, initiative in Albania uh, and we are working a uh, uh, more on that uh, because we really believe it's something that it's needed and we are in the right time and the right uh, place to do it. Uh, in fact, it's an ambitious initiative because it, it requires a lot of uh, energy, a lot of resources to maintain it and advance it. Uh, and why we have chosen to make this, uh, this, um, uh, this platform a multifunction and uh, to provide a lot of services because the Albanian market has the characteristics uh, that you know we need to adjust to it. The Albanian market is small, and uh, we have more than 300,000 small farmers. You know, with average uh, agriculture land between 1.2 and 1.5 hectare of land, which and this this land is even fragmented in five to six plots. So it's not a it's not very efficient. Uh, let's say. Uh, farming uh, activity. So our 
instead of focusing in, on, in one activity, uh, the majority of our farmers are focusing, are doing a lot of farming activities. So they are doing some uh, uh, vegetables, some uh, fruits, some uh, uh, chicken, some uh, livestock, some bees. So they're doing a lot to sustain their activities and to sustain their families and, 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 and become better. So the, in that context, we, we try to adjust uh, uh, the, the services that we provide through the platform to, uh, to their needs. Um, and I would say that uh, having this uh, complement to our financial services, which is our core business, it's really, it, it really creates a great synergy for us. And it really creates a great opportunity for our farmers and our customers and our uh, and all actually uh, value chain actors in agriculture sector in Albania to to to, to find all 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 in one in one in one shop in, in a way. Berla, uh, I want to ask a question. It's sort of a two-sided question, and maybe Leah, you can uh, address it as well. I wanted to I wanted to ask amongst the non-financial services that you offer uh, through the ABA. What has what seems to be the most successful? And Leah, I know you've done a lot of this work as well. Maybe you could give an example of non-financial services that have de-risked or made more efficient uh, financial service access. Mm -hmm. Why don't we start? Why don't we start with Leah, and then we'll come back to Perla. Um, hmm. What are like? about the non-financial services that have been most successful. Um, some of those have been in value chain development. Uh, one of the things we've done, for example, in Azerbaijan, and we, we really did a, a amazing job in bringing parts of the value chain together. So let me give you an example like uh, of what happened. So, um, for example, there's many small farmers, like Perlat said, you know, let's say around a hectare a piece, and they were producing strawberries. And uh, they would, you know, there were smaller farmers and bigger farmers producing strawberries. They would go to an aggregator and then be exported in the fresh market and um, sometimes in processing, some jams, etc. And what we did, one of the biggest things, was to pull the whole value chain together to identify that the exporter could actually double sales, let's say into an export market, but they had to do a couple of things, right? One of the issues is when farmers were picking the strawberries, they were, you know, as long as you have one bad one in there, it kind of spoils the lot very quickly. And so they had sort of talked about the problem and how they needed to extend the shelf life a bit of that container of strawberries and produce more strawberries. And they did that, and through that improvement, the exporter could sell more, and um, you know all the farmers uh, were able to follow the practices that were needed to maintain the quality. And then we arranged like the financing through the value chain. So because and so this way, many times those small farmers wouldn't have got access to finance. So what we did in some cases the small farmer is referred to to the bank because they have uh, this supply chain, right? And they're purchasing all that they can. And sometimes the farmer is still maybe too small or unknown to the financial institution. So sometimes the loans will come to the exporter and work backwards. And be because the exporter has that intense relationship with the farmer, they will on lend to them. So one of these big things that we did was called the value chain round table clarifying what they could do together, each of them improving so that they could sell more, sell in better quality, and then have this return filter down, trickle down to the farmer. So that was one of our examples of non-financial services that were quite useful. That's Over really, to you, Perlat. That's really, just let me interject for a sec, Perlat. That's really fantastic, the, the round table idea. At EFAD, we have something called the multi-sector uh, platform. It's very similar activity, although we have some public sector. I don't know if you had public sector folks involved, but we have some typically. Perla, over to you. Yes. 
Um, as I mentioned, the uh, on-site activities have not been much because of the pandemic situation. So our focus has been uh, primarily on the platform and the services we provide through the platform. So we are uh, managing and we are uh, overseeing the activities that are, are run through there and the traffic that we, we generate over there. So over a period of, uh, I would say, less than 12 months period, we have been able to have uh, more than 7,500 registered users in the platform. Uh, and the number is growing uh, on a daily basis. Uh, so uh, many of them, we, we, we follow the Google statistics and other analysis based on the traffic that is generated. But uh, some of the, the uh, services that they, we find uh, quite uh, interesting for our, our, our farmers is the, the, the daily prices that they can get for vegetables uh, in the platform, uh, the farm calendar activities, so on a monthly basis for nine uh, subsectors of agriculture and livestock, they can find what are the key activities that they, they need to perform uh, on this particular month. Uh, we've seen you know, there is already uh, 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 efforts now to create uh, business links, even though this is very in, in a very embryonic uh, uh, phase. And the marketplace has not uh, has not grown yet, has not taken shape uh, yet. I think it will still take uh, a quite of digital education to to develop that, but we are very optimistic that that is something that is going to work out because. One of the one of the uh, key obstacles for our farmers to be successful in their sales and their production has been to plan for the for the for the next uh, season, because in in many cases, by not having a plan in in, in place, they would run products that eventually would you know would not sell or the prices would go so much down for many reasons. So. They did not have this future sales. So what we're trying to do is uh, to, to, to do that. So we've seen some activity on that, but uh, it's still in a very embryonic uh, stage. And in addition, uh, we have uh, uh, more than 100 uh, professional articles that are written by our experts. Uh, and also that, is, that, that has created a lot of traffic. So I think all of these uh, together are the most, uh, let's say, uh, required uh, non-financial services for now. But... In, in, in cooperation with JICA, we have run also a, a scheme for providing uh, support for for very small uh, for, for 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 small holders and farmers in terms of helping them with the agriculture inputs. Uh, it's like a subsidy. It's a it's a it's a supporting scheme for the for the uh, for the input pro providing for them. So this is this was targeting mainly the ones that were were hit hard by the pandemic situation, so they needed a, a hand to, to raise. So we run this uh, through the platform uh, and uh, we got a lot of uh, uh, requests and attention through that. So we are able to support more than 1,200 uh, farmers to date. And uh, we've seen that this, this project was quite successful. Uh, in addition, we are we have in the platform updated information for subsidized schemes of the government and all the eligibilities so that they can have to benefit, even though that that in many cases is associated with additional help for them, how to apply, how to how to to make sure that they can be eligible for eventually getting these these uh, benefits from the from the schemes. I think one of the things that we found is to be very catalytic, you have to find the one or two information points that the farmers need to really ignite their ideas around, I'm a business as opposed to I'm a farmer. And, and that's not true in all places. And I'm just wondering, uh, to both of you, the examples that you've given, uh, Pernod, do you know how many people that of those 7,200 people that are online how many of those would actually have an agricultural loan? And Leah, would, I don't know if you know the answer to this, because I know sometimes you don't get it in your reporting, but how many people do you think in those strawberry examples, how many of the smallholders would have gotten a loan as a result of the intervention? Mm -hmm. uh, of course, we, based on our, our statistics, we have more than uh, 2,500 that are active members to, to Fed Invest which means that uh, active members are practically the ones who have a, who have a loan with us or who have a deposit or eventually or recently we have opened also we have provided also current accounts and utility payments so uh, but this is uh, 
more recent activity, so there is not much on that. So mainly they have a loan or a earned deposit with us because our core uh, financial products have been loans and deposits for, for over 30 years now, almost. Yeah. Um, for us, I would say we sort of do it for a value chain player. Um, uh, like I'll give you an example. In this example that we had with strawberries, we had, uh, let's say, about three of those value chains. So in one of them, we would have had loans that went to the intermediary for grading sort of packing, right? And we had two categories of loans, two larger farmers, let's say uh, with a few hectares uh, and bigger, maybe in some cases, greenhouses. And then we had probably about 60 uh, very small farmers, right? So in that one value chain it's it's like the strawberry value chain but with you know linked to one export so there would have been probably 80 loans um in that value chain and we did about three uh strawberry ones we worked on hazelnut and and what we found is very much what both perlat and yourself mark have said um you know what do the farmers need they need at the same time a connection to the market to the market right if they can make money on this business, the, the financial institutions more confident, right? And they are too, right? They're, they're growing food. They see the opportunities. And if you can link them to this value chain roundtable, they can see if they make these improvements, then, and they're part of something bigger, you know, then this was a very powerful uh, connector. Yeah. Um, and just like Perlot was mentioning, um, you know, connecting them to those market opportunities, whether you call it marketplace. In our case, it's through the value chain, right? Um, and we also have been thinking about marketplaces. And the marketplaces, like, work if the buyers and sellers are coming together. Um, in the value chain approach, um, you know, you're looking at a very specific supply link and you're trying to enhance volume, quality, uh, quantity, you know, consistency, uh, maybe even food safety standards in there. Um, and what we find is that if you can strengthen one value chain, just like uh, Perlat mentioned, most farmers don't just produce one crop, right? They diversify, right? This is their own risk management. So we found in Kosovo, you know, people are uh, growing uh strawberries they may also be growing raspberries right so the more diversification they have to um, different market players the less the more resilience they have to changing market prices changing demand because in agriculture we know if something is making a lot of money this year next year all the farmers are producing yeah. <laughs> and then the and then the prices go down right so diversification is key um and like you say, access to market information. So I yeah. think the market is a big driver. And that's why we have this interesting instrument called crop receipts. Like yeah. one of the big challenges we have in almost every market is farmers do not have enough collateral. And so we created this instrument called the crop receipt, which is giving a loan on the pledge of the future crop. Right? So I'm not giving a loan on the, on, on the cow, per se. I'm giving a loan on the future milk supply, on the calves that they will produce. Um, you know, so it's thinking in this way. And by creating another collateral, type of collateral, that was enforceable and other things, this also was used by many traders for origination and also used by uh, financial institutions because it was a collateral and there was demand. People were looking, instead of traders were looking to actually buy these receipts from a bank, instead of driving around and finding origination from different farmers. So that was kind of a, a cool idea as well. Yeah. So I think we have to innovate in our instruments. I think there's opportunity through digital. And I think this connection to the value chain or to the marketplace like Perlet and yourself mentioned. Yeah, that's great. I just want to I just want to quickly uh, address a question that Isabel and Marek uh, asked seven minutes ago. Sorry, it took us so long. And then maybe we'll wrap up. Uh, Isabel asks, uh, you know, what are some other recommendations for MFIs targeting farmers to develop their services? Uh, there are a, a, 
plethora of interesting ideas out there, some more affordable than others. One interesting thing that I saw was hiring an agronomist and training them to be a farmer, a, a farm lender, an agricultural lender. That's a very inexpensive way of understanding, and especially if they're from the region, right? Uh, that's a very inexpensive way. I don't, I don't necessarily advise you to do it the other way around. It's much easier to make a, a, a lender out of an agronomist than an agronomist out of a lender. Well, yeah. this is what I would say often at IFC, and you know, uh, yeah. sometimes uh, teased a bit for it, but <laughs> but it, it is true. The the better you understand agriculture, the uh, the less scary the risks look. The risks yeah. become manageable. I mean, we all need to eat. We've been eating. We've been getting cheaper food. I mean, um, in a certain way, if you have a decent farmer who is doing agriculture as their main business, they're not going anywhere, right? They may have a weather difficulty, but in general, you know, they are a good credit risk. And if they are using the right inputs, they should be getting a range of output, yeah. right? You know, weather will make it a slightly higher or slightly less, depending on the weather conditions. So it is almost like an input output model, right? And the better it's understood, right? Then it can de risk or demystify agriculture. Right. Perla, why don't you say a couple last words and then we'll, I'll say a couple and we have, and we'll all take one last shot and, and then we'll wrap up. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, yes, uh, as I said, we we really are looking for work into building uh, uh, our company in, in a company that into one that can provide a wide range uh, of financial and non-financial services in a sustainable way, and we can reach a, a, a scale that really makes a sense for, for the company, for FedInvest, but it makes sense also in terms of our members to, to find uh, their uh, financial services and non-financial services in a cost-effective way. And at the end of the day, we all can grow together and uh, our plans is, is to, to continue to work with the small uh, and micro entrepreneurs and small farmers and really making a difference in, in Albania. Yeah, why don't you uh, take a last shot at the can? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think we have to use a multi-pronged approach. I think uh, at the same time that financial institutions are becoming more interested in agriculture, especially even international investors, um, you know, because we see it's an inelastic, you know, uh, sector. That means everyone has to eat no matter what the economic times. Um I think that, too, through internet and uh, access to data, farmers will become better connected and uh, more knowledgeable on the financial business. Uh, I think big data can help. And I think that using targeted approaches to the markets are key, whether it's a value chain or a marketplace. Uh, I think that makes sense. And I think success is not one silver bullet, but kind of, we can say, stretching all angles, right? To, you're actually making that pie bigger. Um, and I think that is what we need for sustainable development. And the last point is we really need to, to think about climate smart ag now, right? I mean, uh, weather is going to bite us in the backside uh, if we don't pay attention. And whether it's through instruments like insurance or whether it's through resilience investments like irrigation or hail nets or whatever, we do have to consider this as part of the business. Uh, climate has changed more in the last 10 years than it's changed in the last 100. And, uh, agri and climate drastically impacts agriculture. So take a multi-pronged approach. And I, I really want to thank both of you. And I, I'd like to leave a couple messages. Uh, you know, from our perspective, looking at the smallholder as a household, with a, a range of needs that evolve over time, it's been very important to our thinking in learning how we can help financial institutions really provide a range of services. And this can work even for some of the smallest farmers with the low in, lowest income. It can help them with a range of products. We have micro insurance, we have micro lending, we have micro savings, we have all sorts of products as bill payments. All these things now starting to add up to really provide 
brain saving and or investment opportunities for these households. And it's important, and I think Leah touched on it a lot, so that, you know, the diversification of their incomes, their sources, it's not just strawberries and strawberries and bees or strawberries and bees or all sorts of different things, as well as, as I mentioned, migration and whatnot. So that feeds back into this whole household approach to financial uh, service provision. And then data, uh, digital, uh, I agree entirely. Big data is going to be absolutely essential for credit risk management for climate amongst other things, obviously driving down costs of service delivery uh, generally. And I think also, and this is what Perlat mentioned with ABBA, is this whole community or networking idea, provision of information, provision of thoughts going back and forth between farmers, communities. Farmers love to hear stories from other farmers. That's how they get excited to do pro uh, maybe a new uh, product that they haven't done before. So this is going to be key. So networking, so it's more social media kind of stuff. And then finally, uh, I just can't, it's, it, you know, this non-financial uh, risk controlling through better information to farmers. So the kinds of technical assistance that we pro provide on both sides, both the financial service providers and to the farmers. That allows us to demystify and bring down, get rid of all the perceived risk that a lot of people have around agriculture and start uh, providing the services on a, on a, a proper risk basis. Uh, with that, I, I would like to uh, thank uh, both of our panelists, uh, Leah Socorro and uh, Perlat Suli, um, for their time. I'd like to thank uh, all our participants, and I hope that we can um, uh, meet up in person one day. I remember uh, the best, the very best, conference ever in my life was uh, at the microfinance center in person in Romania a bunch of years ago. I, I love the organization. Thank you so much, microfinance center for hosting this panel. Uh, I hope to be in touch in the future. So with that, I'd like to close the session.